marine natural products actually informally started a very long time ago. Um, in what was then considered just an extraction of some sort of a chemical uh, from an organism. The very earliest recorded was back in the 16th century uh, BC, um, where they used a mollusk, a snail, and they were able to extract a chemical in which they were able to utilize for dye. And that's how they used to dye a lot of their fabrics, um, we have bread. It since moved to, and this is an older reference, but one of the first approved products that you have garnered from a marine organism. Um, and in this case, this is from uh, another snail, it's a, it's a conid snail. Uh, and they were able to extract a particular chemical, and leave the chemical pronunciation, so esteemed chemists, um, where it was utilized for um, the reduction of pain. And it was actually, can be utilized depending on the concentration, something up to a more than a thousand times the effect that morphine has. Somewhere in between that particular range, you would have the herbalists. The herbalists, particularly people like from in China and India and those sorts of, uh, of, of places, and this is back in times where they didn't know what the actual properties or the chemicals were within whatever organism that they used. But you would also find that they would garner sponges, for instance. Sponges are very popular in terms of a natural product that was utilized in medicines. And they would put it on open wounds um, and they would have some healing after a coup. So the actual use of marine natural products um, is certainly not unheard of. You would also have, besides the chemical aspect of things, um, in terms of sponges, just bathing sponges. We all know about the bathing sponges that you have. And our natural version is by utilizing some of the sponges that we actually have here in Trinidad and Tobago um, and throughout the Caribbean as well, where you can harvest them, dry them down, and use them as scrubs um, and just as uh, being experience. But a lot of the interest when it comes to marine natural products stems from um, cancer and anti-cancer agents. One of the earliest um, research, what we would consider more modern times, happened um, like in the mid-1940s, um, where in Florida you would have a particular sponge, the spook cryptomethia, so we call it crypt crypts. Um, when doing a lot of our surveys, where this particular person was able to isolate um, the spongerinidin um, and the spongerinidin, both of which are used or can be used as the as an antiviral or as an anti-cancer agent, of which came about the RSC. This is the earliest used um, research product in terms of marine natural products that we have um, today, the one of the earliest that we have had. And this particular RSC is what had actually sparked the interest in utilizing, in this case, um, started off with the sponges, but has since grown to be using um, tunicates. Do you guys know what a tunicate is a tutorial? Mm -hmm. so it's also called a sea squirt, um, if you don't know um, the more popular name. But since then, they've been able to extract um, actually more than 500,000 chemicals. But the problem, of course, is there's an array of chemicals that you have. Not all of them are going to be active in what you're looking for. And you have to actually find that activity um, in terms of the, its use in terms of is it an antiviral, is it an uh, anti-tumor, is it um, whatever the case may be, is it uh, a surfactant or whatever. From the, or since this time, so it's like from the 2004, come up to around 2007, um, from just that particular couple of species, you had more than 30,000 marine natural products plus um, derivatives from those, product, from those particular products in terms of whatever they've extracted that have been utilized and have gone to the stage where you've gotten to a clinical trial uh, as specifically for uh, anti-tumoric or anti-cancer uh, agents or potential for those particular drugs. Um, and you have 
a, a suite of different chemicals that have been discovered just from the Caribbean in and itself. At the moment, you have um, one of the leading pharmaceutical companies, who are, this is Merck, who has uh, an arrangement with Costa Rica, uh, where they are able to, with a joint research that's there, where you can go out and harvest their, their marine products in which to go towards trials or the extractions to get whatever compounds to try for various drugs that you have. Sponges are very interesting organisms as a base organism, not just because of the sponge and the sponge tissue in itself, but it's also brilliant in terms of harvesting and accumulating bacteria. And bacteria one is relatively easy to grow, especially when you have large volumes of it. And then of course, there's an issue with the culturing of the bacteria. But there are other mechanisms in which you can garner some of the DNA and produce various chemicals from there. So there's a lot of bacteria as well as a lot of natural products that sponges actually have. And by running through um, various extraction to get the whatever active compound that you're looking for, with this, um, or a lot of sponges in particular, when you get your crude extract, they were able to find um, a particular chemical that was able to inhibit mitosis. So cancer is, you know, it's uncontrollable mitosis, but hey, you've got something that actually inhibits it. So they were able to, in terms of just various assays, determine that you have um, inhibition at various concentrations, relatively low. But when they, looking at it from just non-treated from a different sponge species, in this case is the Afropolistin, um, looking at it non-treated in terms of activity uh, versus just having something like methanol which will uh, inhibit mitosis anyway, versus the product that they had extracted at a very low concentration, it's considered very low concentration, you actually have the maximum amount um, of activity in terms of cessation of that mitosis. Within the real world, testing it on real cells and not just having it in a plate, um, and just looking at various activities, they tested it on CH and embryos. On the left is where you have natural, normal cell division occurring um, versus uh, uh, the pictograph where you would have um, that same um, pan uh compound that had been used and you'd see that there's no division at all. So it was actually very, very successful in terms of preventing that cell division and therefore they could have gone on to um, further their clinical trials for anti-cancer agents. That's all fine and good, but how actually really does it work? A lot of it, when you start talking about the ecology side of things, is that when you may have a lot of um, similar products being produced, but have very different functions, or you can have very different products being produced, and this is in terms of a chemical that's used to, you know, when you have your lock and keys and the activities that go on, where you can be transferred from one species to another have a completely different function. And this is what uh, we start talking about homology amongst um, species as well. In the marine environment specific, specifically, which you know, it can be extended to just any area um, by and large, is that you have a lot of chemicals that are being produced that are used for defense of an organism. Now in a marine environment, it's, like, it's such a vast place um, to be in, why would you need a chemical defense? Well, specifically if we talk about coral reefs, where corals, most people think corals are rocks, which they are, they're animals, they just don't move from you know, one geographic location to another unless they are in a larval state. But when you have two different species that are next to each other, you do have chemical warfare that goes on. Now it's absolutely fantastic to watch and um, you know, with having watched with a high speed camera. But you do have boundaries in which um, these organisms would um, fight for. And it is a fight because there's death um, of, of the cells. You see it in many organisms in the marine environment. You also see this, that you can have a lot of squishy animals that don't have a protection, um, a hard protection. 
So what other way you're going to do it is, if you can't get away, especially if you're a slow moving organism, you would have a chemical defense. Like a lot of toads and things will have this as well. Competition for food and space. You would also be using um, chemicals. They have it with roses as well, where roses have exude a particular chemical which prevent other species from actually being able to survive if you plant it in that particular area. Same sort of thing um, with respect to competition in the marine environment as well. Again, organisms exude particularly chemicals, whether they're physically fighting or they release um, the chemicals where within they create that boundary around them. They also use it uh, for communication between themselves as well, um, for when they're reproducing, um, you let out a particular exophactor that you have that will in, encourage either other males uh, to come to you, so when you're, when you're grabbing and you're ready to release or have your eggs, if, if it's external fertilization, that they will all gather and maximize um, fertilization in the aquatic area, because again, very few organisms actually produce like single cell, uh, single eggs, um, or you know, double or triple. They produce millions of eggs to be released. Again, of which very few survive as well. You also use it for settling. A lot of the marine species, the invertebrates, are, are travel as larvae, um, and they use chemical cues, and they also exude chemical cues for when they're trying to settle and find just that perfect spot in which to settle and grow as a result. Barnacles do this as well. And then we also have, again, specifically, I'm um, doing this with corals, that they also have products that has been shown to have a UV protection effect. They produce chemicals, and you can have the same species, but in a deeper depth where the sun isn't um, that high, and they would not be producing that particular UV. Bring them up to the shallow surface, and they would start producing um, these particular chemicals as well. So there are a lot of interesting functional chemicals that are being produced within, just within the invertebrate world, um, in the marine environment, that can be utilized in such a vast array um, of functionality that it can be translated into a chemical diversity as well. You also have a habitat diversity that has been found that will also increase, or have shown to be increased, for a chemical diversity as well. Um, and it changes in terms of what the chemical is being produced. Now, you've had either UV or no UV, but in this particular case, where you had a particular sponge that was brought up from the, uh, that was sampled from various depths, and they extracted uh, compounds of which at the very low depths, or well, high bulk, we're talking about low depths, it's sh shallow depths, that it had uh, anti-cancerous um, activity versus when it was very deep, it had an antiviral uh, component to it. So these are there are very few examples at the moment that deal with these habitats because again, it's a relatively new field and it takes many years in which to shift, sift out a lot of these um, particular chemicals. So we spoke about a little bit about the um, the metabolites in a way that the chemicals that are being produced. Um, for a particular function that's extrinsic to the particular organism. In the marine environment, again, you know, the settling surfaces in the environment are very few and far between. You're talking about a vast area, most of which is not inhabited in terms of um, the invertebrates and thriving ecosystems. There's a lot of pelagic, a lot of uh, organisms that just swim past or just use the currents um, and just move and, and, and maneuver themselves that way. You do have various um, vents, the unbeatable um, vents that are happening, you have a very rich um, diversity of organisms, primarily bacteria, um, cyanobacteria is a very popular one, and other organisms that tend to feed on that. But generally speaking, you don't have a very rich area for most of, the, um, most of the marine environment. You would find, therefore, that you have a fight for space. And this is not just talking about invertebrates, then you're talking about marine plants as well. Algae and, and corals, for instance, they don't, mess, they don't mix very well. Algae are very fast-growing organisms, 
where corals are very, very slow. And therefore, if the corals can't protect themselves or protect their turf, so to speak, you would find very easily the algae overgrowing um, the corals. So they would have to have particular defenses. You'd also have what's now being discovered as well, transference of particular diseases from the association of algae against um, the coral species. So there's that dynamic as well that the corals have to defend against. Uh, as mentioned before, you would generally find that the soft bodies, slow moving organisms, tend to be some of the more interesting organisms in which they're targeting the marine environment. You're not going to go in and look at a shark, for instance, uh, although there are certain things that sharks metabolically actually do that are of interest, but given the, um, the, the homology of um, sites and chemicals that are being produced, you would have a much wider range of chemicals um, or extracts in which to utilize from a soft body organism. You also have that in a marine organism, um, because of the effect of water, of the salt water that's around them, that the chemicals that are being produced or the effect of those particular chemicals are extremely strong um, because of this dilution effect. So with a little bit of an extract, you can get a big pow, so to speak. Um, so you don't need as much as you would normally have done. Um, it's a very targeted chemical that you can, you can produce or be produced from these organisms in which to, to sample and get a, you know, so you can dilute it and have many more trials in what you're doing, which is important and we'll get to that in, in a little bit as well. Uh, we spoke just briefly about some homology and looking at um, you know this lock and key thing with where you have acocytes of proteins which can be conserved between species but have different functions. So that comes again opens up the channels in terms of the possibilities of utilizing these chemicals for um, the marine natural products. So far in terms of the types of agents that have been isolated, not necessarily gone all through to clinical trials that have been approved, but in terms of activity, they have found from the marine environment um, a range from, not just from cancer or anti-cancer agents, but things that can be applied to the antibiotics, uh, anti-inflammatory, antiviral, etc., etc. They can be utilized in treating infections, um, asthma, immune diseases as HIV, uh, pain, and of course, the steady state cancer, uh, which is one of the earliest ones. As mentioned before, you have potential for sunscreens as well as size. At the moment, there's a massive um, look at sunscreen effects, specifically from um, the corals that you have in shallow areas and from the Caribbean in specific, you have a lot of activities happening in terms of trying to extract chemicals which can be utilized in making sunscreens more efficient and effective, specifically from corals at the moment. Um, dyes are coloring as mentioned from historic pieces. You also have, and this is in particular to, um, for the first two at least, the use of surfactants. Um, it's heavily utilized even in terms of paints, that you would have the application in terms of antibiotic following. So you want paint in terms of, you know, when your vessels and your boat, you don't want barnacles and other things growing on your vessels. Um, you also have prevention of biofilm formation. So instead of, and because when you have that biofilm, at least in the marine environment, it can grow very, very thick um, and prevent, you know, access in terms of um, clean air or oxygen, because there's oxygen, um, transference from the water and other chemicals as well and you don't want and it prevents good bacteria from settling and in terms of corals where you have a biofilm area naturally that occurs on the surface of corals you have found that some diseases are, have, um, are promoted by a biofilm that has formed particularly with a cyanobacterium um, mix that you have on it that creates an anoxic um, surface 
and it actually kills the coral, it's, it starves the coral of, of oxygen in that particular localised area. And lastly, one of the newer areas in which they're finding is that marine natural products can also be used um, as water purifying agents as well. So all in all, that you would have food additives, food and food additives that are being um, isolated. Um, you have products for cosmetology, general research and reagents, um, the agricultural and the anti industries. So there's quite a breadth of potential in terms of where you can target um, your research with respect to that. I just wanted to briefly show you just some of the species and some of the chemicals that are actually extracted from um, a range of marine organisms. And again, this ranges from simplest from algae, fungus, all the way up to the, the higher invertebrates. That's what you have. There are a number of, of papers that will have lists of the um, extracts that have been um, pulled from various marine sources and they will give the sort of area, the target area in which they um, are applied. However, a lot of the problems is that you have such an array of chemicals and compounds, it's taking forever and a day. So this sort of research, while we are quite happy to try and get involved in, takes a lot of money in which to go through a lot of these trials. And it's a problem unless you have that bigger backing from, for instance, the pharmaceutical com companies or a large medical research and development group which are interested in you know, pushing forward these sorts of research. At the moment, um, the majority of compounds are garnered from the sponges. And a lot of this is because not just the sponges as themselves, but a large portion of that is attributed to the bacteria and other microorganisms that are found um, within the cells and, and within the channels of the sponge themselves. Um, so in terms of Trinidad, what makes Trinidad to be able a really, really good site is that ecologically you have sp specific so sponges now, sponges that are typically found in extreme depths. And I'm talking about, you know, 200, 300 uh, meters down, which is a little bit deep. You will find them at 60 meters. So we're getting the same species at a much shallower depth. So harvesting of those species are much, much easier for us in our waters than they would be for um, another country, for instance. So that makes Trinidad to be able a unique spot in which to try and spin off some of this research, which to my knowledge is really I don't want to say non-existent because there are people who are trying it on different levels. At the moment, there's some research going on for um, creams, for instance, using marine products. Um, but the going is extremely slow. And chat, how many of you guys have even heard that, for instance? It's all kept very, very quiet because a lot of it is self-funded, um, which makes it that much slower or there aren't that many people who are showing that interest in which to go and develop this. Because it can take your entire career just to get one particular compound that might have any interest at all. And you have to have that dedication um, and you know, that, you know, that drive to try and search through all these particular chemicals. Overall, and this is where a lot of it actually gets stumped, is where you actually try and discover what organism might produce an extract that may be of interest. And this is called bioprospecting. prospecting um, Generally speaking, I mean, just from the term, just like you know, any sort of prospecting, it's just like going out there and collecting what you can um, and seeing what happens when you collect it. So you don't go out with any rhyme or reason with any focus in mind, except probably all the squishy soft body organisms, which were, as I mentioned before, are probably a good um, bet in which to get a usable extract. Problem. There's only a finite amount of species that's going to be available in terms of biodiversity. As I mentioned, corals in particular, but other 
uh, invertebrates in general are much slower in growth than you have in plants, or marine plants in particular. Therefore, your source of organisms is not very big. And what does this mean? Is that if your source isn't very big, you either have to very quickly come up with an exudate that can be taken towards the, the chain towards your clinical trials, or you have to find a way in which to um, uh, synthesize the particular chemical that is of interest to you. That, of course, can be, again, a whole different career path for you um, just to do that for some species or for some chemicals. But bigger and beyond that, in, uh, you know, in the 2004 thereabouts, you had the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. And this particular convention prevents this large scale collection in natural areas um, of species, particularly because you don't want to lose that diversity in your marine area because it has a lot of ecological implications with respect to that. So, what does this then mean? You either have to go and if you find a particular compound of interest and you don't have the money in which to say that you can very relatively quickly, in terms of a few years, try and get or synthesize a particular chemical of interest, you would then have to um, grow your own species. And there are a number of aquaculture and, and mariculture opportunities in that sense, in which it's, a whole different, it's supporting that um, industry in which to, to harvest um, the exudates in which you can. And they're in some of the Asian islands and out in Australia, this is exactly what they do because they don't want people going in and just harvesting and cutting down, so to speak, their, their coral reefs and crushing a lot of the ecosystems in the marine environment. So they breed some of the species and this will take time because not just because you get an extract from sponge species A today, next week you go back and harvest sponge species A and you don't get the exudate that you're looking for. Now whether that exudate was um, connected to a particular bacterium or, or a consortium of bacterium within that particular sponge, or whether it was on the sponge themselves and the sponge was going undergoing some sort of stress, for example, and it produced a particular chemical in response to that particular stress, and you just happen to collect um, that sponge at that particular point in time, you're not going to be able to easily then re extract your exudate than what you have. So, again, it's better to have. Um, the growth with the same conditions and stable conditions in which to extract your exudates from when you have it. Providing you actually have that breadth and that wealth of species in which to harvest, the other, though one of the most longest um, parts of time in which you have in, for this process in garnering marine natural products, or any natural products for that matter, is trying to determine or get at the accurate uh, exudate of interest that you're looking for. Um, generally speaking, it's done very quickly because um, as most living organisms, it breaks down. Once you start um, disrupting cells, you have a lot of chemicals um, that are in there that's going to start breaking down um, your membranes and the products within your cells and that soup that you have, which completely changes the chemistry um, on a cellular level. So you've got to be very quick in doing it. Generally speaking, a lot of people would tend to um, uh, freeze, uh, quick freeze a lot of their samples. So you put it in liquid nitrogen as soon as it, you're collect, it's been collected. Um, and then when you're back in the lab, of course you would have a, a you would crush it, have a homogenous solution. You would add whatever um, extractant solution that you have, most likely an alcohol of some kind, produce that extract and then go straight into your assays and look for various types of activities. Um, this is plates and plates and plates and thousands and thousands and thousands of samples and reactions that you're gonna to have to do just to get that one lucky break. But you get that one lucky break and you know that's it for your career. You know? And some people see it as a challenge in which to, to do that sleuthing, in which to do it. That doesn't interest me, to be honest. That. I like the quiz bit, the prospecting part, because that gets me out into the marine environment and going diving. Once you actually have the exudates and you go through various um, 
you know, uh, chromatographic um, techniques in which to try and isolate a specific exudate because you started as a soup, because remember it's a big homogeny um, of cells and tissues of which you've utilized. Um, then you need to actually identify the particular chemical or chemicals of interest, whether it's a single one or working in tandem with another one. Um, and so you need to ensure that you have a large supply of that chemical because this can take years um, just to, to isolate just that one bit. It can take some weeks if you're lucky, but it can take up to a, quite a few years. Um, as mentioned before, especially in, in terms of sponges or any marine organism, because water is such, or the marine water, um, sea water is such an integral part of that particular organism in terms of body. A lot of marine species uses water as a locomotive um, substance. We have bones, they don't. Um, and they would use the water pressure uh, to be able to extend their arms or their, their feet or feet, etc., etc., to be able to, to propel themselves in any um, direction that they prefer. And therefore, to separate that, that water, that marine water that's contaminated, so to speak, with other microorganisms, it's very, very difficult. So to isolate exactly the source of which that particular exudate is coming from is a challenge, again, on its own. Um, and majority of techniques are using the chromatographic techniques, some of which you have to be very careful which technique you're going to be using, you know, to HPLC or um, etc. Because there's some of these compounds that cannot tolerate high heat. So you have to pick and choose what, me me what method that you're going to um, utilize. And a lot of persons, they would have enough sample which they would utilize all methods because you don't know very much about your particular compound, which again means you need to have a pocket full of this particular compound um, of interest. Once you're able to actually isolate that particular compound and get a structure uh, for that, then it can be then utilized and have a different mix in terms of a soup in which they can then create various um, um, the word just flew out of my head. Uh, <laughs> um, medicine, which you can utilize within other, whether it's, you know, to mix with a, a common pill like a Panadol, for instance, or an aspirin, which is just going to make things just that much better, cheaper, easier to use, and maybe a, a simple way to synthesize a particular chemical that has as good as or better effect on whatever it is that you're targeting. Uh, whether it's uh, mitotic division or um, you know HIV, sunscreening, or what have you. But you may be able to find something like that, but the big key, and it all comes down to the big buck, is it going to be profitable? Because these companies, generally speaking, it's not so much for the common good, it's if they can make money. And if they can't make money, it doesn't matter how great this compound is, it's going to be killed right at that particular stage and it will never hit the open markets in doing that. Just um, briefly that you have another way of, of, of showing some of this as well. So you have your sample collection, sorry this is a, a wee bit small. Um, you find your, your exudate, so you get your extractions, you purify it, and by either looking at its toxicity in particular cellular trials or in vitro trials, but as well as getting its actual structure, which may be synonymous to a separate drug, or you are looking for something that key to fit a particular lock, you, you come down with a particular drug, you have a very long-winded process in terms of coming up with um, your crude extract and separating it out into usable products and again you're going from a heterogeneous sample to something that's a mishmash of things if you go from a, a, a biological sample of that sort where you're crushing it and mixing it it's a homogeneous um, sample that you have um, then you need to isolate by the types of products that you have um, and in this case a lot of times they're doing it by the, the weighting of your polarity and the different means and mechanisms in which you can structure and come out with a particular pure compound. Um, and more long-winded way, but one of the more 
cleaner ways of getting um, a, an active compound is by separating out the salts, because again, you're going to have a lot of marine salts that are going to be contaminating your particular sample, of which you can then forget your organic compounds. And then, of course, you find a structure which, um, which is going to be needed for your drugs. Another means of mechanism of which you can do it, instead of just going and getting this pea soup uh, of a sample, you can specifically target individual cells. Now, what is an individual cell of, a, um, of um, for instance, an, an invertebrate, or whether it's um, fungi or algae or bacteria, you can actually target the DNA. And within that, you would have various means of isolating your DNA. Um, and whether you're going for just breaking open the cells and going down the route of PCRs and um, genomic isolations um, of your either the entire genome of the organism or a specific target area of your genome. Because again, there's so much homology between um, species that you can then focus on a specific uh, portion of the DNA strand. Uh, once you isolate the specific DNA of, of interest, then you can go through the screening process on a genetic level. So it's no longer on an activity level, it's on a genetic level that you're looking at, of which you can then, once you've isolated that particular sequence of DNA that's producing that particular chemical uh, of choice, you can then go off um, and have it structurally produced. So where are we here, where are we now here in Trinidad and Tobago, as well as the Caribbean? Um, well, we've just put all these up. Um, not very far, to be honest. Uh, there's a lot of potential in this field. As I said, mentioned in terms of our sponges, for instance, as well as these some screening effects. Um, there are persons or individuals, very small select groups of people who have started into the cosmetology side of things with respect to getting extracts from marine um, species. But because it takes so much money and time and effort and expertise, some of this anybody could do in any university. They're very basic skills. Um, extracting DNA, doing whatever screening, it's a basic technique skill that I'm sure that you, if you haven't learned it, you will be learning it soon. Um, uh, it doesn't take a genius in terms of going through um, various column types to separate and get a particular, it's not a genius level sort of a thing. We have the capabilities here in the country in which to do it, but we don't have the sight further down in terms of going through the long waits, the you know, the masses of negative results just to get that one golden ticket um, in the chocolate soup of the marine field, of marine nature. Um, to date, there's only been, like I mentioned before, just over 30 natural, marine natural products that have actually made it to clinical trials. So where they can actually use it on uh, test species um, and the majority of this is on the anti-cancer Asia. Isolation, you need to have the equipment in which to do it because there's such large numbers of volumes of exudates that's being produced. You need something you would certainly go bonkers if you want to do this individually. So you do want these um, uh, high throughput machinery in which to do it. Now, in specifically in terms of the bioinformatics field, it is very costly to have these machines. Not necessarily costly to actually run your samples, because now for a plate it's between 500 and 1,000 US to do a mass plate. Um, so you can get about, I think it was like 10,000 leads, if I'm not mistaken, for like 500 to 1,000 US dollars. Which I Yeah, but you've got to read off, yeah. Well, it's got to be like 5,000 US. No, well, no, it, there are. Yeah, but now there are places in Venezuela and other places, I know. Uh, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, where, exactly. But there are organizations who invite external persons to be using equipment so you get it cheaper because of that. 
So to you to run your own sequencer, you have to have a lot of money in which to, it's not a piece of kit that you want to just have sat there where it just accumulates. It's a business. It's more like a business. And that's why they invite external um, people to, to submit their samples to run it. And that's why they can run it at cost, basically. Uh, in which to do it. Up to like a thousand US. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, source is a problem, but again, here in Trinidad, in terms of source being looked at in two, two ways, into, uh, like source and uh, supply as well. Source in terms of source of the extracts themselves, source as the source organism that you're using, and um, you know, where you're, where you're going to be getting it as well, and how costly it is to retrieve it from the marine environment, because again, some of these organisms are found in very deep areas where they are primarily reliant on their, um, their toxins to survive in the environment that they're in, um, or that the supply of chemicals, equipment in the lab, etc., etc. We are in Trinidad and Tobago, not, it's not easy for us to quickly get some of these chemicals. It can take months sometimes. So if you're going to be running a lot of this, you would want to buy things in bulk. To buy things in bulk, you need the dinero to do it. So there is a lot that we can do, but we have to make a concerted effort in which to do it. Now, Last time we were doing this, there were a lot of people who were interested in the bioprospecting part, mainly because they get to go out into the beach, into the water, and they can go out and get a suntan while working, um, you know. But that's a very small portion of it because you can't just arbitrarily go out and harvest species and organisms that, that are there. You should have some sort of a target in mind to help, especially where we are finite in terms of our um, marine resources um, and we also have in some areas not many protected marine parks we've got one in Tobago we have um, uh, protected areas it's not a park but the areas in which they are heavily looked at and very much frowned upon and then you've got your CITES in which if you're going to if you're going to do this with an external company and chances are it's a liaison with these pharmaceutical companies um, that you need to have your permits in which you can, um, if you're taking the, the sample, the biological samples themselves and sending them abroad into those labs where they're capable of doing a lot of these things. Or if there's enough of a movement here, and I think QCT has a unique opportunity in which we can move towards this area and it's persons like yourselves that are going to be the foundation, the fundamental force behind something like this, where you can go out, not just for marine natural products, but this whole idea of going in and harvesting from our natural environment um, chemicals and compounds, which can be utilized in our medical field. So we have certainly a fantastic opportunity in which to move into this particular area. That's it. No, it's something that we, 
Yes, there are many actually. Coral farms. Um, a lot of it has been for translocation of species. If there's been um, a ship grounding, for instance, and there's mass destruction of corals, um, lots of disease, you're trying to replenish areas. Um, people do grow corals in which to do that. There are various techniques. And again, we're still very new in terms of marine sciences here in Trinidad, but it's something that we are actively going to pursue um, in terms of raising corals. Again, it's, it, it's a long-term investment. Pardon? It, well, funnily enough, yes, it's time, but it's not a lot of work. And it all depends on where you want to do it. If you want to do it in, in situ, in the marine environment where you go in, they're very, very simple techniques. Um, in, uh, in the Philippines, they, they use it a lot, um, and in Thailand, they use it a lot because they do a lot of apple farms there, where very simply they would have um, snippets of tips of the corals, or cores of corals, and they would attach them. And what, all that's needed is that you go periodically to go out and you ensure that you clean the algal growth off of the edges and what I'm saying is that you can simply do it even like your barbed wire, not barbed wire, um, the chicken wire, and you can just lay out a stretch of things and you can do it. If you are specifically interested in a particular species, you can go and harvest the eggs and sperms and the various techniques that you can go out to do it and corals, um, you know, uh, emit their, their, Sponges are much faster than corals. Corals are on average like 10 centimeters a year in terms of the fastest growing ones. Um, sponges are, you know, um, can go up to 20, 30 centimeters, depending on the growth form in which you're looking at and the conditions in which you're feeding them and everything like that. But they are certainly easier to grow than we have for, for corals. You might like emitting, sorry, you might like emitting in the environment. You can, you can do it in a tank. You can do it in a tank. But um, you do find, or what has been found, that you things that go on in a tank is very different than in a natural environment. Even in terms of bacterial activity, the sorts of chemicals that are produced, and you do have to try and simulate. There's a lot of factors um, that you have to try and simulate if you want it as close as possible. But like I said, if you found those right conditions for specifically what you want to produce, then you know. You've got lots of butter for your bread. Yeah, and when you grew it, <laughs> you need fishes around. Not necessarily. Um, fishes are partly they would harvest and they would help clean the coral, but you can manually do a lot of that as well. And you simply don't want necessarily fishes unless they've been quarantined because they can transfer diseases and then poo can also transfer lots of things as well. Yeah, <laughs>
there's mainly for the species that are, that are protected on the CITES that you would need to go and get this. For the most part, you can actually do a lot of stuff in the field, um, and which is better, it's less um, destructive. But, well, the thing that, that leads me to the, the next question, because um, our students, I think, the part I think that you guys could really enjoy and work with is the, 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 the mm -hmm. isolation of the natural products for you know, disease and different types of applications. But you know, to do every single stage, as you say, is very tedious. So yeah. like, our students could probably do, like if you know somebody's bioprospecting, they could like extra samples. So if the students don't have to, you can if you want, or but I'm that you don't have that stress. They collect yeah. for you, and basically you get it in the lab and you can start your testing precisely. Yeah. I mean, getting to the, to the point where you get that key soup of things is very easy exactly. because it's just going out and you know doing that. If you want to do it on a cellular level, then you know a lot of times in that sense, for the most part, you're harvesting um, bacteria, fungi, and is, algae, and for the most part, because they're easy to grow. Do you actually isolate mostly bacteria from these sponges that are used as natural products, or is it from the actual coral itself or sponge itself that you take? Is six eggs a dozen, or is it six eggs? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't know. If you decide you, know. you specifically want to target the bacteria that are out in the corals, then you can go through um, the various separation techniques in which you can use. Um, to pull out on whole cells, um, or you would extract or or Why can't you just pull out everything and just run it through a DNA? Um, like mm -hmm. you run it through an extract. You can. You, you can do it, but you can then, if it's specifically bacteria, you can then target. Um, you know, use a particular vector and go exactly. to the bacteria, and you only grow up the back. And that's how a lot of marine bacteria actually grow, because again. Growing it on a cultural level, it's, it doesn't work very efficiently at all. So yeah, so what is done a lot of times, you would have um, you know these vector forms where you then go into cultures and get once you get your pro pure cultures and you can go forward. Similarly, you can do it with other cells as well if you're part of a particular strand of DNA as well, which is that part of the stuff. That's what we've done because we were looking for we were looking for a product for. Um, uh, marine natural product, which for the most part is utilized in the medical field. Uh, we were looking at it in terms of the production of mucus within the corals because coral mucus, as I said, even with the surface mucus, it's very synonymous, oh, it's synonymous to the mucus in your gut. So what goes on in the coral on that level, we can use the coral as other organisms as an avenue to looking at diseases in your gut. So that's the level in which I would primarily at. Any other questions? Uh, I'm just trying to make a small comment. Not that I'm, uh, I'm the least educated among all of you <laughs> on this subject, and perhaps not uh, likely to speak also. But just a general comment, you know, that uh, for long now, there has been a talk in Trinidad and Tobago as to whenever gas and uh, iron resources, they go dry, then where does the economy of this country go? To. Where does it go to? After the gas. You know, yeah. likely to continue, maybe likely to last about 12 years more. Yeah. Maybe you, now one year of that is gone. Um, <laughs> yes, now 11 years. Then you have oil which is almost declining, and uh, whatever oil you have got, uh, Venezuela is more powerful than us, and they can always draw it from their own oil fields. So, what do we do after a decade or so? This talk has given me an idea that, uh, okay, I'm no expert in mechanism. That if this if this is small island state's economy is to is to divert you know, yeah. some alternative root of your economy, you know, if you are to maintain your same lifestyle, we have to find new avenues for generating new resources, the wealth. Mm -hmm. And going in the pharmaceutical area based on the MNP, this could be a, perhaps a most natural route for this country to go to yes. to generate create create medicines, have a big pharmaceutical industry. In fact, there is next to nothing, you know, in Tinder and Tobago, I found. Ah. So one, yeah. this is one, where we can go in that direction. Maybe we have collaboration with so many Jones Hopkins, this, that, and we can have collaboration with many other universities who are, or the research stations who are making use of the MNPs yes. for generating, you know, the resources, the wealth, 
revenue. Number two, as a chemical metallurgist, so as uh, till day, I was uh, interested in marine resources, you know, only for you know, extracting the nodules, you know, the metal nodules from, yeah. the, the, from the marine surfaces. And uh, you know that this all over the world, the finest, the most, the purest form of manganese, have you heard of manganese? Manganese has metal. The purest form of manganese the, is available from the surface, you know, of the oceans. And that is one area where most of the people are fighting with each other. Some countries may go to war to extract their claim in those areas from where they will be extracting the manganese nodules. Not only manganese, the most precious of the metals can be extracted from the earth's, uh, from the marine okay. surface. But that's also on your little marine snow. It's why? That it's, it's basically the bodies of organisms, primarily the, the microscopic organisms, that fall um, and settle and in deeper waters. You would have this very fine, fine silt uh, that, again, you'd see if you watch Nat Geo. And all that is made up of marine snow. And that has become one of the biggest interests in the energy sector because it yes. produces large volumes or can produce large volumes of methane, which can be utilized okay. uh, as an energy this source. Is. So the, the marine area is very rich in potential. Uh, we have done nothing. In, the, in the fact, you know, nothing. you said the sky is the limit. I said the, the <laughs> 10 kilometers. Yeah. Yeah. You said it's the limit. No one is you know all these yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the microbiology and so on and so forth. Think of the country. Think of the economy of the country. Here I will tell you that this is an excellent way to diversify the economy of this country in this direction. You will make a lot of money. You have some collaboration with other countries, other labs. Develop it. Stand on your own. Make money. And you have to say that everybody is making profit. Why not do it? And then don't forget, leave that to me as a bit dirty skill. That I will, I will uh, recommend this. I have already recommended this to the government. Okay. That you go for this. Uh, you know, my colleague Pratima yeah. uh, used to yeah. be there and she was a yeah. great expert in locating all the languages. That is a great source of a very good resource. You just take it out with me, very little uh, treatment, the surgical yeah. treatment, and you get the finest of the product. Which will sell like hot cake in all over the world in the metallurgical and the engineering industry. So these are the areas. Yeah. So this is the area yeah. which, yes. I mean, just how covering yes. organisms function is of interest because there's a particular sea fan which we get here um, for going to Ventum Island where, where you have a tumor forming on its tissue, it will grow and encapsulate that tumor and form a nodule around it. Inhibiting the, the, the continued growth of that tumor. Why and how um, the good event of Ina does this is, is not really clear. You know, and so if we can if we can follow and figure out something like that for cancer patients where you would have the immunology of food, that is in a research it's a research that can be done. Research in mechanism and then yeah. kinetics of the growth of that. Precisely. Yeah, yeah, that, is so, yeah. that is the very thing that we have to work. But certainly the techniques are not new, they're not scary by any means, they are, you know, something in terms of takes time, it will take some, some money, which again, if you have these collaborations, they can do it. But it's simply something that we can do, but we aren't, and it's for up to persons who are in this room and beyond to try and go towards that.